Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we are here today. Um, I am here with Jackie Clark, who is our breeding and puppy program manager. And she has um, the lovely and adorable and now lanky Pad Sawyer. Um, and um, I am Tara Doherty, Pads' communications manager. And so welcome. We're glad that you're joining us. And if you're joining us um, on Facebook Live, you can uh, comment in the comment section. Tell us where you're watching from. But you can also add um, questions into uh, the comment section, and we'll try and answer them um, live on air. And if you're watching us on Zoom, um, you can click uh, the chat box or the Q&A box uh, respectively. So if you have a question you want answered on air, just hit that Q&A box. But in the meantime, click the chat button and just tell us where you're tuning in from. So um, just a little bit of background, if it's your first time joining us, is Sawyer is six months old now. Uh, she joined our program. She's a bit of a special girl in more ways than one. She is a lab golden retriever cross who came to us um, as part of a breeding exchange program, which I'll let Jackie tell you about in a second. But she's also, um, you can't tell right now as she has her back to us, but she is also uh, black and tan. So she has brindle markings um, on her paws and her face, et cetera. So she is a little cutie. Um, and um, we're going to publish an article at some point about how that works and comes to be. But in the meantime, um, Jackie, do you want to just uh, tell everyone where um, Sawyer came from and a little bit about why she's here in our program? Yeah, so Sawyer um, originally hails from Brisbane in uh, Australia. So um, her ancestors for many generations have never felt temperatures uh, like she's felt here. And uh, she has come to us uh, along with another puppy, Franny, as part of an exchange with an organization in Australia called Career Dogs Australia, which breeds assistance dogs for um, a number of schools worldwide, uh, many of whom don't have their own breeding programs at this point. And uh, so our hope is that uh, Sawyer and or Franny, one of them will mature or both of them will mature to be breeding dogs because they bring in genetic diversity to our program, but it's kind of early to tell at this point. Um, you know, it's it's like looking at a 13-year-old child and trying to determine who is going to be um, a lawyer, who is um, going to be a chef. You just really don't know at this point. So. Um, we're not putting all our eggs in that basket for her. She's going to be programmed just like our other puppies, uh, but it would be a nice bonus if she matures into a breeder. Wonderful. And I just want to touch on that briefly so everybody understands, because I think a lot of times there's a perception that we raise dogs for a breeding program and we raise, raise dogs for our training program. And it's actually we raise all of our dogs the same, regardless. They all, most of them come in as breeding candidates for our program, uh, the vast majority, um, because as Jackie said, you can't tell at eight weeks old, which ones are gonna do what. So um, every dog that comes in uh, through our breeding program or through the breeding cooperatives, et cetera, um, our breeding candidate. Um, and then, you know, that list gets whittled down by Jackie and her team um, and our friends at the ABC Cooperative to kind of select the very, very best candidates we can to move our goals forward. So, but with that, let's talk about where Sawyer is at, which is really why we're here today. Um, so we've been checking in. If it's your first time joining us, you can go back and watch and see the first few episodes with Sawyer um, when she first arrived. We've kind of been doing these um, periodic check-ins with her um, to kind of follow her through puppy raising. So where are you at in the land of puppy raising, Jackie? How are you doing? I remember this age. <laughs> I'm doing okay. There's been, uh, um, you know, some good reminders. I think it's, it's great when our puppy raising team um, puppy raises because it, it gives us kind of a, a new um, appreciation or a renewed appreciation for what our puppy raisers go through. Um, and I think maybe we'll start by talking about physically where are we at in puppy raising because if you've tuned in the past couple of times, um, you may have noticed we were at my home. Today we're in a pad, and uh, that's very purposeful because if we uh, do this with Sawyer at home, we're going to get one. Uh, whereas when we do these sort of things out in the world, 
um, we're going to get different different experiences. So what we're really focusing on now in Sawyer's puppy raising is taking the skills that she's really learned and honed at home in terms of you know how to settle down um, and rest when you're not paying attention to her, um, how to not action prompt, and we're now starting to take those into the big wide world. So at home, she tends to be fairly quiet now. Um, those of you who turned it, tuned in early know she used to have some struggles with her kennel, um, any kind of confinement really, and now she'll very happily go into her kennel um, just on her own, but also if we ask her to, um, she'll go into her kennel in another room and be fine. Kind of the big challenge at home now is if somebody comes over to visit and she's in her kennel in another room, that's still a bit of a problem. So that's kind of our next steps at home. Uh, but then if we take her into a different situation and we kennel her, uh, we're still getting a lot of the same behaviors because she hasn't yet generalized that concept. So uh, kennels at home are good now, but kennels in the wild world are still something different. So her training right now is focusing on kind of applying those lessons that she's learned in one context and showing her that the, the same behavior applies over multiple contexts. So whether that is being here at work with me and being able to lay quietly under my desk or um, being in one of the kennel runs here because we're doing a breeding or we're doing something with a puppy in training and it's not really appropriate for her to be part of the action. Um, that's the next step of what we're working on. And so uh, just um, kind of by the way my week worked out, we were here yesterday for the day. And so you can see even just today, she's pretty settled in this environment. And not that I would expect her uh, to be fearful because she isn't, but just that she um, is not being super busy right now. Um, she's not having to go and investigate everything. She's kind of internalized that message that, um, oh yeah, this is just like home. Like if Jackie is, is busy, then um, she isn't my business. And we'll see because we, what we might get here um, is we might get some action prompting um, in a bit where she'll bark at me and then we can focus on that because that is one of the things that we're dealing right now with right now is that she would be happy and have my attention um, either in petting her or in just feeding her 24 hours a day right now. That would be her dream. And so the times when uh, she is offering, you know, like if you look at my attention, and she isn't getting it, we're still getting some frustration there. She's like also scritches. Scritches are the best. So if you're just tuning in and watching us now, we're here with Jackie and Sawyer. If you have any questions for Jackie about Sawyer or any questions for me just about the program in general, feel free to throw those in the chat box um, uh, or sorry, the comment section on Facebook Live or the Q&A box on uh, Zoom if you're watching on Zoom. And um, so with that, um, what are you working on in terms of skills training with her right now? Or are you so still- in terms of skills, So in terms of skills right now, sorry, I don't know if you were finished. No, nope, go ahead. But, um, she uh, is getting really good, sits really good for her. Here is a thing of beauty, her recall um, in all environments. Um, we're pretty good at loose leash walking. Um, we're offered down, but it's not really on cue yet. Um, but the thing that we are working on now is being able to like settle into it and just, oh, and also she's trying to tell me, she also loves chin and she's very good at chin. She likes to really commit to it. I don't know if you can see, but she is pressing <laughs> her head down in my hand and then is assuming that my other hand is moving to reach for a treat, but um, I haven't asked her for this behavior. So that is not what's happening right now, little girl. Um, but this is what I'm saying about the action prompting is, is it's constantly like, can I get you to, um, can I get, do something that's going to get you to reinforce me? So what we're working on right now is, that's very nice. I like that. She would love to sit here and stare into my eyes and have me just feed her. And as long as I'm going to feed her, I'll show you, as long as I'm going to feed her, she is going to stay in that down and she is going to look at me and she will continue to gaze at me adoringly. Nice. She'll continue to gaze at me adoringly. However, if we go to a restaurant, 
I'm going to get this staring. And then when she doesn't get what she wants, um, we'll see in a minute. Can you see her tail, Tara? No. Okay. Um, so if she doesn't get what she wants, you'll start to notice she will flip over onto her side, her little tail will start going, and she's basically saying, okay, the picture that I think should work out, I'll turn this way if that's the one. The picture that I think should work out is not working out for me, and so I'm gonna start to alter what I'm doing and see if, see if I can get the behavior that I want out of Jackie. Thank you. And so that's very nice. So she will stare at me through an entire dinner and then start to bark or through an entire movie. Like she will not settle down um, if she thinks that there's still treats coming. So what we're working on is we're working on teaching her that putting her head down um, when she's in a down in this situation is what's wanted. So I don't know if you've noticed a couple of times, but she's kind of ducked her head down. And so if we were in a training session, I would be reinforcing that. But we're also going to use that chin cue we were talking about earlier. And I'm going to put my hand up the chin. And she is going to put her head right to the ground in that chin. Good. And then good means the treat is going to come to her. So she shouldn't jump up for the treat. It's going to come down to her. Good. And so we're working on shaping that head down to the ground and breaking that eye contact so that she's not continually kind of in that action prompting phase with me. And this is a case of form following function. So yes, she is not relaxed right now. She is super intense. However, we're building in that understanding that laying and looking at me isn't what I'm after. Laying and putting your head down is what I'm after. And then we can eventually build that into even just a little reminder with her collar. You know, I don't want you to put your head down. And so if she starts to get into, um, you know, an action prompting cycle, then I am going to just kind of guide her head back down and eventually I'll be able to do that without any treats. So she goes, oh, is there treats? I kind of reach down, guide her back into head down. She pops up again, I reach down, guide her back down. And eventually she goes, oh, I guess we're just gonna like hang out here fun. I'm gonna put my head down. So um, I'm just gonna interrupt things for a second. I have uh, Heather here is going to show, help us show what another one of our struggles are. And then we can go into kind of how we're going to tackle this over Christmas break, where this is going to be a big struggle. So we love to jump on people. And if people are greeting us, or trying to say nice to us, we love to jump on people. And we cannot control our little selves about jumping on people. So, where we're going to start with this is when we know we have guests coming over. First things first, Sawyer gets to be on leash. Good girl. So that it is less likely to happen. Nice work. I like that. Good. And then, good girl. And then she can't get to Heather. So I am not pulling back when she pulls, unless if she was, if I thought she was going to make contact with the kid, I might, might pull back. But I'm not trying to correct the behavior with. My leash, I'm just trying to stop it from happening. So when she goes yes towards Heather, I'm just preventing her from getting all the way there. And what I'm gonna do instead is I'm going to reinforce the behavior I want for, yeah, for her when people come, which is not to hit the end of her leash. Just hang out here with me. Good girl, are you ready for go say hi? So for go say hi, we know that she does not have the skills to do it. And so just telling her is not going to be super successful. So I'm going to tell her to go say hi to Heather, but I'm going to use my treats to keep her head down while she does it. I know. Very nice. It's so tempting. Heather is so much fun. Good girl. So you know, chances are Heather's visiting my house. What she wants is not to pet Sawyer on her rump. However, that's about what Sawyer can handle right now. So again, we're going to say hi. I'm going to leave her in, let her turn around, and Heather can say hi to her. And we're getting the behavior we want in a way 
that is not rehearsing that jumpy. Because that jumpy is really reinforcing for her, um, even if all she gets is Heather kind of squealing and thrashing around. So that's how we're going to set ourselves up. And then in the meantime, the girl, will you jump on me? She's like, I won't jump on you. So in the meantime, we're starting to work on, you know, if I get really excited, will you jump on me? And the answer is no. And then we'll start to get other people. So Heather's not going to be super animated. Heather's just going to come over and a little bit. Yes, good girl. And before she can go while her feet are still on the floor, I'm going to mark that. Yeah, and you see that time she's like, oh, I very deliberately made the decision not to jump on Heather. Yes, good girl. Very nice. Yes, good girl. So that time she's like, oh, Heather is a tricky one. I think I'm just going to lay down because that's so much awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. Ooh. The little tip of her tail going is the best part. <laughs> She's like, I got this. So I think the other thing we've talked about a little bit is just that um, there's stuff going on for dogs as they kind of move through these kind of developmental stages. And if we think about human children, how much they change from being toddlers to being um adolescents or or preteens and then adolescents and just kind of what's happening kind of neurologically kind of in their brain development in terms of how they process the world and take things in do you see similar things in dogs and puppies in terms of like how they respond to the world around them are they more I mean we talk about adolescents and kind of defiance often go hand in hand um where is she at right now? And then what do you expect in the coming months? So we're not quite in adolescence yet. I, I mean, I would say from being a parent, don't tell my kids, but I would say preteen is, has always been more difficult for me than a teenager. Um, and so definitely you start seeing behavior changes even before you start going into adolescence, right? And, and that's the case for dogs as well. So, um, you know, we, as they physically grow, we tend to think, well, they should be getting more mature. But the truth of the matter is they just don't have an adult brain yet. And so, um, you know, we see, I see a lot of like impulsivity in her right now where things in the environment are so exciting and she doesn't have that ability to make a good decision. Even if she has um, kind of this, the individual skills that she would need to put together in order to make a good decision, she just doesn't have the brain capacity yet. So, uh, you know, if we end up in um, a murder, she is very into movement. She is very into into prose, uh, and that's a massive struggle for her in the environment to try and stay engaged. So we're working a lot right now on that sort of thing, um, and also just that she doesn't have kind of this stamina. So I have um, a three and a half year old lab who is a delightful buddy that you could just go out and walk all day on a leash and she would be engaged in everything else. And Sawyer doesn't have that, right? I, I, I and um, I'll, I'll give you a little story that, um, you know, kind of it is one of those humbling experiences for us as dog trainers where I took Sawyer out, we're gonna get the bark now. I took Sawyer out for a long walk on the weekend on a leash and uh, we got about an hour from home and things were going really poorly. And so the downside of that is we're an hour from home. So we still, oh, if we're gonna bark, we're gonna get up. Uh, so we still have to go back home. Uh, and so, you know, things have kind of fallen apart. And I was thinking to myself afterwards, you know, we've done long off-leash hikes and they've been really successful. So what's the difference between the two? And really the difference between the two is, you know, on a long off-leash hike, she's doing a lot of sniffing, not a lot of running, but a lot of sniffing, a lot of exploring. And then every once in a while, I'm calling her back for very brief, focused interactions. And then she's kind of off doing her own thing again, as opposed to asking her to concentrate for two hours on walking nicely and not pulling on the leash and being engaged, where, you know, she just doesn't have that um, level of, of um, focus in her, right? Like that's quite a mature dog skill. And so just kind of having that reminder of what looks so different about 
those scenarios. And as a puppy raiser, that can be really hard because you can take your puppy to a situation where you think that they're going to do really well. And all of a sudden the wheels kind of fall off and you have to go back and, and think about it critically. And think, okay, so what was there from the times that we've been successful? And then, you know, what kind of thing do I need to do outside of that situation to set, to set us up so that next time we're in that situation that we're going to be successful? Nice. So I don't know if you caught that. I just want to, I'm sorry, Tara, I'm monopolizing your time, but um, That's okay. she started staring. There's a window, a door of the window off that way. And I think there must've been somebody moving through it. And so you saw her just zone out and stare yeah. and she is so aware of me. And so this is one of the things too about patients and trying to teach her how to settle is that, you know, movement is so important. So we were here a couple of weeks ago in a different building, the sun was shining and she could either see if she was looking one way, she could see people moving through the window or if she was looking the other way, she could see their shadows move against the wall. And she just could not settle down because there was so much movement going on. So things like that, be constantly vigilant about, nice. I know I saw that this Heather, about with her and then kind of get her to disengage from that movement rather than getting her, letting her get really locked onto it. I'm laughing because Cadence has come over and she's grumbling, I think, because she hears you using uh, uh, markers and she's like, there's snacks available. Yes. So I apologize for the yeah. background noise, everyone. Um, it is just Cadence hoping that there will be uh, some uh, nice cookies coming her way. So um, and so I think um, in the coming weeks, I'm just going to pause for a second and let folks know because we've had a bunch of people join us in the last couple of minutes here um, that we're just here with Jackie, our breeding and puppy program manager and Pad Sawyer, who's six months old. And if you have any questions for us, feel free to post them in the comment section. Um, if you're watching on Zoom, you can also use the Q&A button um, to type in any questions you might have for Jackie or I or Sawyer. Um, she probably won't answer, uh, but uh, any questions about the program or about Sawyer, um, please feel free to, to chime in and ask and we'll try and answer them. But with that is what is the next step for Sawyer over the holidays? So holidays are a particularly uh, challenging time for puppies, well, dogs in general, but especially puppies. And so how does all of this translate into that season? So, I mean, I think the biggest thing for me is imagine her as though she is a toddler or a preschooler. And if you've had anything to do with toddlers or preschoolers, uh, kind of what it looks like when they're not getting enough sleep. And that's the big risk for the holidays with puppies as well, is that, you know, we're going on and there's so much going on and there's so much stimulation and especially so much that's new and novel, which is even more challenging. Um, and then they're not getting enough kind of good sleep during the day and so um, you know it's really going to be a priority for me I still want her to sleep you know probably two good two hour like full out sleeps during the day um, and if I can't get that then maybe sleep during the day but I want to make sure that she's getting that really good sleep because as soon as she gets overtired um, her behavior is going to start to deteriorate and uh you know, none of us are going to have a good time at that point. We're not going to have a good time wherever we are in public. And we're probably also not going to have a good time once we get home and we're trying to settle her down for sleep. So sleep's going to be the, the first big thing for me. Um, and then kind of trying to make sure that when there are things that are really stimulating happening and uh, there's a lot of excitement and stuff that she has something to do. So for instance, Christmas morning, I have uh, three kids, um, you know, we're probably going to have for the dogs on Christmas morning. Um, and so that she has something to have herself. And as if things get excited and uh, kind of chaotic, she still has something to hold her attention. Uh, and then, uh, you know, just kind of looking out for those um, holiday uh, kind of hazards, you know, the if it's cold outside, watching for about our, the snow melt um, because that can irritate her pads. Um, watching for um, we're going to be out of town, so if it's too cold for her feet, making sure that um, I've conditioned her um, to wear booties. 
and uh, you know Christmas dinner, making sure that she has somewhere safe to be so that she's not eating um, stuff that she shouldn't be and that she's not getting stuff that she shouldn't be from under the tree. So we don't have kind of any of our edible gifts don't go under the tree. And uh, when we first set up the tree, it was barricaded for a couple of days to keep the ornaments safe. Um, and the ornaments have kind of lost their appeal now. And so now we've progressed to not having to barricade the tree um, and kind of become a boring piece of decoration in the house. Excellent. So I just want to point out here, you can see she's starting to make good decisions on her own. So she's still not relaxed, but instead of barking and starting to think maybe the way to get what I want here is actually to fake that I'm relaxed, um, which is much nicer than barking and staring at me. And it's kind of a step on that progression to getting where we want to be in terms of her just being able to live in this environment. And I, you know, it's funny, there's different things that we train our dogs that are really important. And so one of them is going to the bathroom on cue and the other is like, um, learning to like, just relax and like shut off their little brains. And, but I have always loved the really smart ones that are like, okay, I'm going to pretend pee, like I'll squat, but I'm not actually going to go to the bathroom, but, um, you know, I want to get the cookie or I want to get the treat. And, but it's, it, there is a little bit of that, like fake it till you make it where like they start to kind of understand what is wanted of them. And, and, you know, I love, you know, I, I think we both had the privilege of watching, um, the genetics evolve over time, um, with all of your hard work. And I think about how different our puppies today are, um, than the puppies I raised, you know, 17 ish years ago at pads and this level of being operant and like just offering behaviors is something that I think has been a really dramatic shift. And, and, you know, I think, you know, one of the comments um, that you made years ago was it's important that we focus on breeding dogs for our clients, not breeding dogs for our puppy raisers, because these dogs are harder to raise. And yet um, you know, I think about um, some of the dogs um, that I've had over the years that were just utter delights to raise, very easy to raise, and yet not one of those dogs wound up having enough oomph in them to be able to actually do the work long term. And and I think too, you know, I look at a dog like Cadence, for example. So for those of you watching that don't know, Cadence is my mobility service dog, is that she is quite a willing dog that likes doing her skills, but um, she's coming up on eight years old, which is hard to believe. And um, I'm seeing how her response time is slowing down and like the speed at which she's doing things is starting to slow as she gets older, because like humans, dogs slow down as they get older. And so we're also, Jackie's working really hard to breed dogs that, you know, are going to be able to do the work when they're two and when they're three, but also when they're, you know, seven and eight years old, they're still going to be, um, you know, excited and willing to kind of do that work. Um, and I mean, certainly, um, when our dogs do start to age to the point where they're like, I don't like doing the work anymore. Um, that's the point at which they retire, but just to kind of have that general kind of personality demeanor that they're willing to kind of do the work. So, um, I'm just going to double check that we have any questions. Do you have anything you want to add at the end here, Jackie? We've got a couple minutes left. I just wanted to talk a little bit as I'm for me. So she keeps getting off of her bed and thinking like, maybe this is going to start to keep using gentle leash pressure, bringing her back to her bed and like, nope, this is what we're doing right now. And it's because, thank you, I don't want to be bitten because they have gotten pretty um, kind of engaged, they definitely think other dogs are super interesting, um, you know, actually paying her, I'm not the center of her universe. Um, we can get into a habit of really managing what she's doing all of the time with our food, right? So I still have, I have her breakfast still in my pocket and all of that, um, managing what she's doing. And so, you know, we're, we see another dog and I'm going to, you know, cram food into her face. Um, 
uh, Heather comes in, I'm going to cram food into her face and our food to manage. So for instance, if we know we have to pass another dog on the street, there's no other option. I'm going to reach for my food and do kind of like a food lure where I have her stick right to my hand and, um, and give her food for that. But in general, I want to be using my food for, for building the behaviors that I want rather than managing the behaviors that I don't. Because when I'm managing her behaviors, she's not actually learning anything. So it's not changing the outcome of what happens the next time, you know, the next time Heather comes into the room. So instead, I'm using my leash a lot at this point just to limit what her options are. So, you know, I shortened it up earlier so that um, she's going to be able to make contact with Heather if she decided she was going to go. Um, but also pulling me towards the building. I'm not going to use food to try and get her to walk nicely beside me. I'm actually going to turn around and walk the other way with her. Having to go towards the building um, is dependent on her kind of engaging with me and walking nicely. And then when she is engaging with me and walking nicely, I say that till the cows come home because now I'm building the behavior I want instead of just trying to manage the behaviors I don't want. So that's kind of one of the, the you know, potentially potential stumbling blocks in this preteen stage and going into adolescence is that we fall into a habit of using our food to try and manage what our dog is doing, which isn't teaching them anything. Um, instead of saying, okay, if we're not getting the behavior we want, can we add some space and get the behavior that we want? And then also can I use my food to build the behaviors uh, that I do? Also to build a dog that doesn't think, you know, heck, if I misbehave, maybe is, you know, if we're in public with these guys and they bark, we're really quick to try and feed them to stop them. So I want to build in um, the ability to relax and stuff without it depending on me feeding her so that she's learning uh, the skills that she needs out and about. Yeah. So we did have one question come in, which I'm going to start to answer, but then I'm going to let you finish. So um, Danny was just asking what breed Sawyer is. So Sawyer is a lab golden retriever cross. And Jackie, um, a, a lot of times people are confused because she looks like she's part Rottweiler. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I mean, she. it depends on kind of the stage of growth up to about three weeks ago. She looked like she was part Dachshund because she so um yeah they i mean the big answer the, there's a really big convoluted answer but um you know kind of the easiest way to explain it is we're used to to thinking of their being two, um two sorry two genes in labs that affect color there's the e gene which affects whether or not um and then if that gene says no the dog is not yellow then there's the b gene that determines whether the dog is chocolate or not and if the dog is not yellow and if they're not chocolate then they're black but they can still carry yellow or chocolate but in reality there are other genes that act on it so there's um the a gene determines whether the dog could have a pattern in its fur and what the pattern would look like um, and then there's a recessive form on the k gene that says yes, the dog can have a pattern, the pattern will be brindle. And so the A gene says, if Sawyer has the genes to have a pattern, this is where the pattern is gonna be. And then the K gene says, okay, great. We are gonna let this dog have a pattern. And so that pattern is going to be brindle. And, you know, it's like saying in humans, there's a gene for brown eyes, and there's a gene for blue eyes, but it's not really that simple because we all have seen people with blue eyes that are blue all the way through. And then we've also seen people that have blue eyes with brown around the irises. And so it's those other genes that come into play that kind of determine what else can be there in terms of patterning. So right back to kind of the 1800s and the founding of the, the Labrador breed, there are records of black and tan occurring in Labradors. Um, but again, it kind of requires the perfect alignment of those four color genes for that pattern to be expressed. And so there's a twofold reason why we don't typically see it in labs, building on what Jackie was just saying. So one of which is that you have to have that perfect alignment between the dam and the sire in order for it to be expressed in the puppies, which requires some intentionality on the part of the breeder. Um, 
it can happen just by fluke sometimes. But the other thing is, is um, the common response we get is that the dog is, um, you know, crossed with a Rottweiler or Doberman or something like that. And so um, for a lot of purebred lab breeders, they will actually select against it. So they will not breed dogs to each other that have the op the potential to uh, have this appear. Now at PADS, we breed strictly for health and temperament, and that is what we're kind of driving our goals towards. And so we, if we um, get a pretty little lady like Sawyer that has some interesting markings, uh, that is um, not neither here nor there for us in terms of um, uh, whether or not she's selected for breeding or who she's bred to. Um, you know, we laugh um, because I once whelped a litter of puppies and texted Jackie to say, I think I have a litter of pound puppies here because every single one of them was so different. They barely needed um, collar colors on them. We had white blazes and some of them were black and tan and some were black and brindle. And yeah, there was just a big hodgepodge in the litter, which um, happens uh, when we're breeding uh, for this. So we have one more question and then we're going to wrap up. I know we've gone a little bit long here. So, um, and so the first question is, what happens if you breed two brindle pups to each other? Um, will all the pups be brindle? Or are there chances that some of them will come out solid? Or black and tan, I guess, because we're talking about two different things. I'd have to look back on my genetics and see if they have to be, if they have to be recessive at age, okay, which is probably getting a bit too technical, then okay. yes, they would all be brindle. But I don't know that off the top because again, it's not something that we're breeding for. It's something that crops up and we go, okay, great. Yeah. You know, like, okay, neat, I guess, not even great. Okay, neat, that dog produces black and tan. Um, but it doesn't, it, it's not looking to create um in Sawyer's litter so her mom is a lab gold one parent is a lab one parent is a golden so she's 50 50 and she looks very much like Sawyer Sawyer's dad is a purebred black brindle and her entire litter was brindle so I think that it would be likely but I would have to look at, at what those genes say, say specifically yeah and we've seen it more in our I feel like we've seen it more in our lab golden crosses than we have in our lab labs, but we get it in both. Um, so, so it does appear in purebred labs as well as in the crosses. So it's not just a function of her being a lab golden cross. And like with lab breeders who are producing pets as you go away from it, um, but they would only see it in their black or chocolate colored dogs. They wouldn't see in their yellow colored dogs if they were carrying it. And so with golden retrievers, there's never been a need to breed away from the K the KY gene because um, the yellow masks it all the time. That golden color masks it all the time, and so quite a number of goldens that actually do carry the brindle genes, and it, the the uh, yellow gene kind of suppresses everything else, so it doesn't show. So you breed them to a lab, and um, yeah, we tend to see uh, it, it be expressed in that way, and you know, kind of. If you ask me, like, is anything about Sawyer genetically? Probably not. I mean, the super cool thing would be she has the potential that potentially she could carry a, a long hair gene and so to a golden retriever or um, another lab golden cross that happened to have a long hair gene. I get puppies out of her that were long haired as well. And so, um, you know, genetics is a funny thing, and there's a lot of things that we can test for right now. Um, and I think I said this on a, on a previous two mentioned day, but you know, we're considerate of how we're spending our donor dollars. And so, you know, digging into do our dogs have long haired genes and do our dogs carry certain color mm -hmm. genetics um, isn't isn't where we're spending spending our genetics testing money. We're spending um, the different disease traits that we can test for genetics. Excellent. Okay. Last question. Um, Reef. Uh, so Sandra is asking, Reef is the same age as Sawyer and we're having barking for attention challenges. Thanks so much for addressing this. My question, sometimes at the um, end of our not very long walk, Reef goes into zoomies and mouths the leash and tries to jump. Are these signs that the quite short walk has been too long? What do I do? I try nice, which sometimes works. If possible, I just um, drop the leash and continue to walk and Reef follows. 
often it can be that um, you know arousal levels have gone up in the walk. Um, sometimes even when I do it, start walking the other way because sometimes that's enough to just interrupt uh, what's happening. And I may also be inclined to toggle between um, kind of different arousal levels. So things like doing gaze changes, so speeding up, slowing down. That's learning to kind of adjust between arousal levels as opposed to like I hit 100% and now I'm stuck at 100%. Like he knows how to himself up and down. And for her, she bites her only a bit. And I tend to interrupt it. The big thing for her is she likes to bite nabs, leashes, or walking as well. Um, and so sometimes it's another form too of that action prompting, right? Like if I do this, I know I'm going to get a reaction. So if I can't get the pass um, and ask her to do something else instead, or I go, well, if you're going to bite your leash, we're going to turn and walk backwards, which is never what she wants. She always wants to go forward because we are in front of us. Um, if we've already passed it and it hasn't been interesting, she doesn't want to go back towards it. Excellent questions. And thank you so much, Jackie, and for the extra, a little bit of extra time here and for the great questions, everyone. Um, thank you um, for tuning in with us today. Um, just a reminder, we're going to have a bit of a break over the holidays. We'll be back in January, um, but um, we are running right now our um, treat a puppy campaign over the holidays. And so you have the opportunity to uh, feed one of our puppies for a month or um, provide them with their first starter kit or um, or even feed them for a whole year. And so um, feel free to pop over to our website. Um, we'll pop the link in the comment section on Facebook. Um, it's just pads.ca slash give um, and uh, contribute to our holiday campaign. Um, because what that means is dogs uh, like Sawyer that are going through training um, will have all the nutrition they need uh, funded, which is a big part of our budget every year. So um, I just want to highlight that opportunity that's happening right now. And um, and I also love watching Jackie play airplane with uh, Sawyer. So um, just saw a couple of comments pop up. Oh, and thank you, Meredith, pop the link in. Um, so, um, oh, just a quick question saying, really enjoying your, your live streams um, and educational videos, Jackie. If somebody um, was wanting to learn more about the basics of genetics. Um, do you have a website or a resource um, that's available to the general public that you could point to? Oh, color genetics or genetics in general? Um, you know what, we'll ask that question and we'll see if they respond. So coat color genetics or genetics in general. And then maybe what I can do, Jackie, is get you to just send me a couple of links and I'll pop them into the comment section after the fact. So we will, uh, answer your question, Ella, we just need a little more information from you um, in terms of what you're looking for. So um, there are some good, um, I know for sure there's some um, very interesting Facebook groups that I follow um, where people are trying to like unriddle genetics and there's lots of super helpful people uh, that kind of come on and I've learned a lot through there. So we can post some of those, um, but oh, hang on, we have an answer. Um, Oh, I have a link, Ella, that I will post uh, that will answer questions about Sawyer's appearance. So that's oh, what she was more curious. Okay, so um, the other thing I want to say is if people are interested in coat color genetics, there's two really good podcasts on the Good Dog Pod, um, where they talk to a geneticist about different color genes and different um, coat genes, and it, it's designed to be really accessible to um, lay people and to breeders. Uh, and then I know Functional Dog Collaborative, um, there was a little bit of a brouhaha uh, recently about somebody asking about a lab with black and tan markings. And so they actually went in and did a whole podcast about um, dog color genetics as well. And, you know, like how, you know, on, off colors um, appear in different breeds of dogs. So, you know, in labs, black and tan or brindle are, are kind of off colors. In poodles, um, if you get party colored poodles, P-A-R-T-I, which is 
even though they're not solid colored poodles, that's um, according to the breed club that's default, but uh, it's you know perfectly um, accessible within the, the genetic really good on the good dog pod um, within the, the genetic really good on the good. Excellent. Okay, well, we've posted a few links in the comments and uh, we'll pull up uh, that link as well from uh, functional um, breeding their blog and the good dog one I think um, Meredith has already posted up there so um, thank you Jackie so much uh, again for coming on we'll let you go I know we've gone quite long here, um, but um, really interesting discussion and it's one of the things I love about Tune In Tuesdays is it's always a bit of a choose your own adventure um, and uh, in terms of the questions that get answered so thank you for uh, taking uh, the wild ride with us as we look at uh, Sawyer's development but also her interesting appearance and a little uh, rabbit hole down into canine coat genetics which uh, one of the things I love about Jackie is she's just a vast resource of knowledge on these things so thanks everyone for joining us we will see you in the new year and have a very 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 happy and safe holidays and um, we will see you soon thanks Jackie bye everyone